Hi, I'm Sonja Englert. Welcome to another one of my airplane design tutorials. In this one, I want to talk about structural fatigue, what it is, which materials are the most susceptible, when and where cracks can develop, and what can be done to minimize the chance of fatigue failures. Because airplanes have to be designed for lightweight, the stress level in most components are much closer to the failure limit than in other vehicles. This causes airplane structures to be more at risk from failures from cracks over time, as it has been shown quite spectacularly in some cases. First of all, what does fatigue mean for structures? Everyone is personally familiar with fatigue. After strenuous exercise, you feel worn out or sleepy. It is similar for structures. When they are worn out after a lot of flying activity, they would like to be retired from service. If that does not happen, they eventually break. To explain why this happens, I will use this piece of aluminum as an example. It is repeatedly stretched and released for many thousands of cycles. During each cycle, where some of the stress is in tension, a very small amount of damage is caused, sort of like tiny cracks. By the way, only tension causes problems. Loads that produce only compression stress do not cause fatigue damage. For a long time, these cracks are so small that they are not visible. If the part was loaded to failure after about 10,000 of these cycles, it would fail at a somewhat lower ultimate stress than a part that had never been in service. If the stretching cycles of the part are continued, the damage continues to accumulate and the micro cracks turn into real cracks that eventually may become visible. The cracks may be tiny on the surface, but can progress unseen internally. Once the, once the damage is done, it cannot be reversed or removed. Eventually, when a crack re reaches a critical size, it propagates suddenly and the structure fractures. The number of cycles after which a part fails under normal service loads as this Cessna 210 wing here, or if it maintains its integrity until the end of its ser design service life, depends on many factors. I want to mention the most important ones here. The magnitude or amplitude of the stress which the part is subjected to has the largest influence. If the loads are high and the part is stretched close to its yield strength on every cycle, it will fail after very few cycles, as I am here demonstrating with this lid of a metal can. There is very little or no warning at all before fatigue failure, therefore the consequences are often catastrophic. If the stress level is low, a part can endure hundreds of thousands of cycles. Below a certain stress level, some materials can even have an unlimited fatigue life. The design of the part also has a major influence on its fatigue life. A bar with a constant cross-section has a uniform stress distribution and is the ideal case for a long fatigue life. If it had a hole or a notch, there would be stress concentrations. The fatigue damage at a stress concentration can be many times higher than in a part without this. If you take a metal rod and cut a notch into it with a saw, and then bend it back and forth, it will eventually break right where the notch is. So wherever possible, stress concentrations must be avoided. Surface roughness and scratches also cause stress concentrations. A smooth or polished surface is best. The material selection influences the fatigue life of a part as well. In general, aluminum is worse than steel, composite is better than metal. Wood comes out on top. After all, if trees fatigued, they would not get very old. If a part survives 10 million cycles, it can be considered safe for an infinite number of cycles. Materials that have high yield strength, but are hard or brittle, are worse than more ductile materials, even though they may have a lower yield strength. This is particularly important to remember when selecting aluminum alloys and tempers. These aluminum alloys are lined up in sequence from better to worse fatigue strength, from left to right. Soft, easy to bend material with low yield strength is on the left, while al alloys from the 7000 series 
which have higher strength but are more brittle, are on the right side. The 2024 alloy is a popular material used on airplanes because it offers the best compromise between strength and fatigue life. Aluminum parts in general do not achieve an infinite at fatigue life and will eventually fail even from small stress amplitudes. The fatigue life of a material is determined through tests. Samples are subjected to load cycles of different magnitudes. In fatigue life analysis, it is important to distinguish the stress range, which is the difference between minimum and maximum stress, the stress amplitude and the maximum stress. It is the stress range rather than the maximum stress that drives fatigue damage. In flight, for the most part, turbul turbulence provides the load cycles on an airplane and the stress range varies considerably for all of its parts. The stress ratio R, which is the minimum stress divided by the maximum stress, determines where the SN curve will lie. Common stress ratios are between minus one and plus one. The fatigue characteristics of a material are shown in a chart called SN curve. The x-axis shows the number of cycles at which a specimen will fail if it is tested with a stress range or amplitude shown on the y-axis. The x-axis is usually shown in a log scale. This chart shows a comparison between aluminum and steel. Steel may reach an endurance limit, while aluminum does not have this. Fatigue life curves for common structural aircraft materials can be found in Mill Handbook 5, Metallic Materials and Elements for Aerospace Vehicle Structures. It can be found online for free from various sources. The example chart shown here is for notched specimens for different stress ratios. Here the y-axis shows maximum stress. Fatigue is not just the result of mechanical load cycles. Thermal load cycles can also cause fatigue damage in metals, for example in aircraft engines. Air-cooled engines go through large temperature changes in addition to vibration, during which the material expands and contracts and fatigue damage accumulates. The crankcase cylinders and cylinder heads and exhaust pipes are at risk. Once a crack shows up in a case, for example, it is an indication that it is near the end of its fatigue life. Even if the crack can be repaired, the rest of the material is probably not far behind and cracks may soon develop in other places. It is therefore best to replace the damaged part with a new one. Composite structures are more fatigue resistant because the load-bearing fibers are so small in diameter. Simply said, if one is damaged, there are many more to take over. The matrix or resin does fatigue, and here it is important to design the part to orient the fibers so that they are in the direction of the loads, and the matrix only has the job of holding the fibers together. Additionally, there are much fewer holes in composite structures, which equals fewer stress concentrations because the parts are bonded instead of riveted or bolted. The fatigue life of an airplane is typically set equal to the life of the highest stress part, the wing spar. The designer has to limit the maximum stress level in spar caps, with considerations for stress concentrations, to the desired number of cycles on the SN curve for the material used. There is always a trade-off. If you select a high cycle number or more ductile material, the design maximum stress level is lower and the part has to be made thicker and heavier, or vice versa. For metal, there is a fairly large difference between the load at failure of a new part and the load at failure of a fatigued part after many cycles. For wood and composite parts, this difference is, is much lower. A good design fatigue life for, for a small airplane is 10,000 hours. Obviously, the designer cannot predict how many cycles the airplane will endure during its normal operation, so he will have to make some assumptions. A metal airplane that spends a lot of time in cruise in smooth air may not develop any cracks for 15,000 hours. 
another airplane of the same model that spends all its life flying through turbulence or which is used for frequent aerobatics may fail after a much lower number of flights. Because the airplane structure is much more complex than that of the samples which were used to determine the SN curves, there sometimes are surprises with high time aircraft. This was the case for the al all aluminum Blanik glider, where a wing failed in flight from fatigue damage at the route. This resulted in limitations for the fleet. A maximum of 100 hours of aerobatics, a maximum of 25,000 winch launches, and a maximum of 2,500 flight hours with two occupants. This picture shows stress analysis of the wing structure at limit load. The colors indicate where the highest st stress is, in the spar at the wing root. Critical for fatigue is only the lower spar cap, which is stressed in tension. A modification was developed to reinforce the critical areas, which lowered the stress in the existing structure to increase the fatigue life of the wing. With the mod, the owners now have the choice of no aerobatics and life extension to 5000 hours useful life, or some aerobatics and 3750 hours of useful life. The modification consists of an additional root rib bracket, the addition and replacement of several highly loaded rivets, and an additional reinforcement plate attached to the lower spar cap at the wing root. The fatigue life of a new airplane is estimated by analysis and simulated by testing components like complete wings or fuselages with a cyclic load spectrum to failure. If for example a wing fails on the test stand after 18,000 simulated hours at various load cycles, its service fatigue life is this number divided by a safety factor, typically 3, so it can safely 5 or 6,000 hours. Even before the design fatigue life is reached, parts of an airplane can develop visible cracks. Common places for cracks to show up are aluminum spinners and baffling because of the high vibration level in the engine compartment. Once a crack is found, the part should be repaired or replaced before it fails completely. If you find a crack in one part of an airplane, you have to assume that the airplane has already accumulated a certain amount of fatigue damage. It should be thoroughly inspected in critical areas, such as lower wing spar caps and connections for visible cracks. Another example of fatigue damage was found on the upper wing connection of a biplane where the bolts failed in flight. If possible, evaluate the risk of a catastrophic failure based on the airplane's operational history. Like many low-level flights in turbulence, aerobatics or primary flight training, and the service record of other airplanes of the same model. Other areas that are at risk are thin-walled aluminum ribs and control surfaces, especially in those areas that are subjected to additional loads from engine vibration, prop wash or flexing. A part that is weakened by corrosion will develop cracks and fail much sooner than an uncorroded part. Here it helps to inspect the structure of a metal airplane frequently and use corrosion protection where possible. Once there is fatigue damage, it cannot be removed. Here is a summary of guidelines for good fatigue life of an airplane. Material selection, design for low maximum stress, avoid stress concentrations, corrosion protection for metal structures, Minimize number of load cycles during the operation of the airplane. I hope this has given you some ideas on how to consider fatigue in the design phase and during the operation of the airplane. If you are interested in a long or unlimited fatigue life, fly wood or composite airplanes. Beware of buying a high time metal airplane, especially if it has been used for aerobatics. <laughs>